How is it going, everyone? It is Glick here. Finally bringing you the first episode to my long-awaited debut personal podcast. This is G-Sync. Season 0, episode 1. So, before we jump into all of the madness and all of the stuff that I kind of want to rant about today, I'm going to start uh, off here with a little bit of a description and uh, I guess a sort of timeline as to um, pertaining to this whole podcast ordeal because when it comes to podcasts, I'm probably one of the least woke people out there, to be very honest with you. Um, I did start one. Uh, actually, I've started two. I, I started two. Um, Both of which were for two completely different side projects. One was gaming related, one wasn't. Um, And actually, now that I think about it, I believe both of those were live format podcasts. So I did one for expforall.net. At the time, I had a um, uh, a group of writers, and uh, we were all writing for the website. And uh, every week, I'm not really sure (laughs) how many we did. Um, but we did do a live show every week sort of talking about the news. And then we did an overall discussion pertaining to a particular topic. And then uh, for one of my other projects, it was pretty much something of the same format, except it just wasn't related to gaming at all. So um, both of those were very short-lived um, as far as the podcasts go, at least. Um, so I wouldn't say I have a ton of experience running podcasts. This is... This 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 I would say is my uh, my first real uh, my first real foray into the whole thing. But anyway, I wanted to uh, start out talking about some goals and uh, I guess an overall TL and explainer as to what exactly this podcast is going to be about. Why does it exist? All that sort of stuff. So, um, I guess first and foremost, right? What is G Sync? Um, <laughs> I don't know how I came up with the name. I don't really know. Sounds catchy. Um, It's also computer related, digital related, which for the most part is exactly uh, what this podcast is going to be covering. Pretty much anything in the uh, uh, mostly gaming related stuff, mostly digital entertainment related stuff. This episode in particular is going to be very heavy on the video game side. Um, Yeah, actually, it's just all video games this time around. Um, But I really just wanted to start a... uh, start a uh, small, honest, uh, humble little talk show just talking about the main things I like, which pretty much is just, you know, gaming, music, and (laughs) entertainment. (laughs) I know, so unique, right? So unique. Um, But yeah, for the most part, this will be a gaming-related podcast. I did did want to find a way to, um, to throw in some, some, uh, metalcore, related uh discussions or a segment or something uh you know something pertaining to you know the genre of music i i listen to the most nowadays which which is which does happen to be metalcore um <clears throat> but you know as i find myself playing a, a a wider variety of games nowadays i'm also starting to really begin to appreciate sort of the music and video games again like man going through Going through a lot of these Dragon Quest games have really just like I've I've I feel like I've missed out on so much. I've missed out on so much really good music and games. Um but yeah, we'll see how we fit that in. But anyway, um so yeah, overall it's just the podcast talking about things that I like the most. Um first and foremost though, this is gonna be an audio podcast right off the bat. This is season zero, and honestly, I would I, I would tell you to expect for the most of season zero, um Expect that most of these episodes are going to be audio only. Obviously, um, I think originally my I originally I wanted to come out the door swinging with all live, all live format, all video format. But um, you know, I find that audio is uh, first of all, it's a lot more easier for me to do. <laughs> I don't have to worry about uh, I don't have to worry about cleaning <laughs> my area that's going to be on camera. I don't have to worry about um, you know lighting and all this other stuff and multiple things malfunctioning and whatnot this is just a much more simple way for me to start out um you know to uh get on a good schedule um and just overall finding the footing of the show which uh brings me 
to the next thing, um, you know, this is going to be a sort of thing that we're going to kind of uh, build it as we fly it sort of situation where I'm not exactly sure how many sort of segments I want to do each week. Uh, how many of those segments are going to be pertaining to gaming? How many are going to pertain to music? How many are going to pertain to just other alternative, you know, uh, geek, nerd, anime, culture sort of stuff? Um, but I want to do all of that, really. But we're going to have to find a way, or rather I'm going to have to find a way to do properly balance and fit them all in into their own little segments. Um, <laughs> as you can tell from the intro, we still got to get, I still got to get a, a, a good podcast intro. Uh, I don't even have my sound effects. I don't even have my sound effects ready to go this episode. Um, I suppose I can edit them in and <laughs> in post, but um, yeah, it really just goes to show that this is sort of, this is building the foundations, which is exactly why I went with season zero for this, because um, I, I don't think it's worthy of being called a season one. This is season zero. This is the 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 foundation building really of this uh of this podcast and i guess if you want to know all of the other things that uh, i had in store like a full write-up i think i did a blog entry um on the podcast so you can also check that out over my web over on my website um glakegg.net um and yeah check out that announcement but i'm gonna be talking about some of that stuff today so um, as far as what's going on leading into, you know, the start of season zero here and the beginning of season one, which um, right now I'm planning for uh, January of next year. So January 2023, um, I, I want to say like probably around early, maybe mid-December, I might start messing around with um, uh, episodes in video format that could even come earlier. Um, and when I say video format, I don't mean live i just mean you know i'll start doing rather than it just being my voice it'll be my face and my voice and some video feeds with stuff i would like to share and then um also i think around that time would be a good time to start sort of solidifying a circle of constant co-hosts i guess i uh, i guess i could say who i would ideally like to rotate out uh with every few weeks or every few episodes or so with uh, different people, different faces. That's sort of the goal that I have for this. I would like to have as many different people on here as possible. Um, I don't know tons of people, but hey, if you want to just, <laughs> if you just want to hop on a show and just, you know, not have to talk that much or talk when you want to, this is the perfect thing for you because honestly, um, I just want to have fresh voices, fresh faces. Uh, every episode, maybe not that many people, but at least, you know, like a rotating cast, a rotating uh, table, um, a rotating selection, a buffet of people, basically, um, each and every episode just to keep things fresh, uh, because you'll get bored of me fast. Trust me on that. You'll you'll get bored of me fast. You're probably already bored. You're probably bored right now. How many how, how long are we into this? Almost 10 minutes. I don't know. I'm going to lose track of time really quickly um and then into the future and beyond so you know uh, i guess well into 2020 or sorry well into season one and uh the beginning of 2023 and beyond i suppose <clears throat> uh the end game well maybe i shouldn't say end game goal because i don't know what that looks like yet but i know for sure as we f as i find the footing for this as the foundation is built i think evolving this into a more live show format um, which sort of showcases pre-recorded content as well, like as sort of a compliment is kind of what I'm looking at. Um, so that's definitely something that I would like to do, uh, in the very near future. I really don't want that to be that much further in the future. I think especially, um, as I get traveling more and going to more events and more just, uh, cons and stuff like that, I want to be able to you know, record content and have that on the podcast. I think that would be really cool, a really cool thing to do. Um, or even be able, like, if I know any co-hosts or anybody who I think is going to be on the show, uh, anybody going to stuff like that, they could record stuff of their own and I could show it on here, whether it's, you know, their own personal vlog updates on their channels or stuff they want to do and just exclusively premiere on the show, whatever works. I think that would be really cool to have. Um, so that's kind of what I'm looking at going forward here and I think um 
uh, after uh, after 2023, or not after 2023, but I suppose after January 2023, I think it would be safe to say that most episodes are going to be live. Um, that's kind of the goal. That was kind of the original point, is for all episodes to be live with audio formats available immediately afterwards. Uh, that's kind of what we're looking at, because I think most podcasts these days, for the most part, are recorded live, or <laughs> recorded live, are debuted live, um, broadcasted live, so, um, yeah, I guess if there is an end game, that's that's the end game, is to make sure everything is live, um, I, I suppose that'll be Twitch for sure, and, you know, if I decide to broadcast it live anywhere else we could do that but uh twitch for sure i guess for the most part um which actually i'm gonna take it back a couple steps i think before we get to that point um and this is something that'll probably happen a lot sooner maybe in a couple weeks um is i will be doing i, I suppose in a way i will be broadcasting or i will be broadcasting the recording of the podcast as it happens live in my personal discord in the phantom society discord um and that'll just be for you know whoever just wants to listen in as it's being recorded you won't be able to hear the sound effects because if i do that in post you know obviously it'll just be more of like a candid conversation uh so between me and either just myself or between me and the the co-host for that given episode or week so um yeah I guess that's the closest thing to a, a live format that I'll be doing uh, very, very soon, hopefully. <clears throat> so I guess stay tuned for that if you're in the uh, Phantom Society Discord, and if you're not, join us. Join us. Um, but yeah, that's sort of the uh, tentative timeline and uh, goal sheet, I suppose, as far as what I want to do with this and where I want to take it. Um, I'm sure more ideas will pop into my head as time goes on, but... Really, with this first episode, I just, just want to get the ball rolling, as rough as it's going to be. <laughs> I just want to get the ball rolling and uh, and kick things off. So, with that, I think it's time to move into the next segment for this episode. And uh, this is going to be our news talking point segment for this week. Um, now obviously, you guys just know how much I love to cover news. Journalist, journalist Glake, right? Oh my goodness! Uh, but no, really. Um, I think at the beginning, at the top of every show, it's gonna be talking about the latest news, announcements, reveals, what have you, uh, pertaining to gaming, you know, digital entertainment, that sort of stuff. Oh boy, excuse me. I need to, uh, I need to get a sip of sip of tea real quick. <clears throat> Sometimes I wonder if I should edit stuff like that out. <laughs> Drinking tea. This is as close to a live podcast as it is if I don't edit it outside of sound effects. Um, but yeah, at the top of every podcast uh, at the beginning, we're always going to talk about news. So that's what we're going to do today. There's actually a lot of stuff to touch on because some of the stuff I feel like also slightly spilt into last week. I think it's mostly this week news. Um, but some of the stuff also spilled into last week. And I'm going to walk you guys through some of this stuff today and um i guess first and foremost on the uh on the list here is probably i want to say it's probably the biggest announcement for this week uh one that i thought was pretty cool but we're gonna have to wait a little bit longer until we get more information on it and that is verizon that's right the cell phone company they have teased a 5g gaming handheld which is being i guess developed by razor um which is pretty interesting here you know i've got the the verge article the verge report up on it which uh that brings me to another thing real quickly <laughs> for now i'll be uh i'll be reading these announcements from other websites since uh you know i haven't been keeping up on news very well on my own personal site on expforall.net but once I do, I'll just be referencing back to those articles that I've personally written. I probably won't even need to because I'll probably just memorize what I wrote. Um, but for now, I'm going to be checking out some of these uh, other articles. But uh, this is from The Verge. <coughs> so we got uh, Verizon Tees is a 5G gaming handheld made by Razer um, with Razer and Qualcomm, which is 
set to be fully announced on October 15th at RazorCon. I didn't even know a RazorCon exists. Is there a con for like every <laughs> like every uh hardware accessory manufacturer out there? Like is there a Steel Series con? Is there is there an Astro con? I don't think there is. Like why why does Razor have a convention? Anyway, this is news to me. Uh, uh, the carrier talked a little bit about the device, which would be called the Razor Edge 5G at a keynote at MWC Las Vegas, saying that it'll run Android and give you access to cloud gaming services like Xbox Cloud Gaming. Unlike devices like Logitech's recently announced G Cloud, however, it does seem like it'll be able to play games stored on the locally uh, stored locally on the device as well. So that's pretty cool. Um, <clears throat> when it comes to these, I don't even know how to call them. These phone, <sighs> no, 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 no. Let me not even call them a phone. Let me not even call it a phone gaming device. It's literally just these cloud gaming devices. When it comes to these things, even though, uh, they have some pretty impressive specs, even though they have some pretty imp impressive specs, I'm just like, if I if I have to, if I if the only way for me to play on these things is via a cloud service, I'm not going to be interested. I don't understand. I guess I don't understand why. Okay, somebody's got to be buying these things. Obviously, somebody's got to be eating these things up. I don't really know how many of these we've had or something akin to this we've had. I guess since uh, all of these, uh, all of these, you know, big companies have started offering cloud gaming services. Um, the Steam Deck doesn't count, and I don't even know if the Steam Deck has the capability of doing cloud gaming. But the Steam Deck is something completely different. I'm talking about something in this ballpark uh, where it's developed with cloud gaming at the forefront in mind because I feel like it's a pretty common consensus among the gaming community that nobody likes cloud gaming. Like if, if it were up to us, we want all of our stuff, you know, physical hardware, if possible. I think for some people, um, I suppose, especially like in, in, in over in Asia, like in Japan, Korea and stuff like that. I think they prefer, I mean, they prefer that kind of stuff because, you know, commuting and whatnot and having small devices is good. You don't have to lug around cartridges, discs, all this other nonsense. Anything digital and cloud gaming just makes it easier, I suppose. <clears throat> but I feel like for the most part, it's just not it's just not good enough. It's not good enough. As a matter of fact, he, over there, cloud gaming is probably a little bit better because the internet is a lot better over in Asia compared to like here in the West. I just don't understand. Like I, I just don't get it. I just don't get it because lag and input delay and it's just so many things, so many different things. Like it's just not refined enough. I find it crazy that like if it doesn't work well on consoles, how in the world are they supposed to expect? Like if this crap doesn't work well enough on consoles that are hardwired, you know, etherneted to a modem. How is this going to work on a, like a, a, a digital or I'm sorry, a, a handheld, a portable handheld? Like, I just don't I just don't understand. But anyway, I've already ranted too long about that. But um, while details are relatively sparse, uh, we have heard of a similar device before. Qualcomm Snapdragon G3X handheld gaming developer kit. That device, which was shown off late last year, was made to showcase the company's G3X platform which is what Verizon and Razer's handheld will be using. Now, this is probably the most impressive part that I've heard about this entire thing. And it reads, according to Qualcomm, its G3X chipset supports external displays up to 4K and has a GPU capable of running games at up to 144 frames per second. <clears throat> now, that's pretty cool. For, for a handheld device, that's pretty nice. Like, if... I could be playing some games, and I don't know if the Steam Deck is capable of that. I'm not sure. Um, like, I can't think of, like, I mean, I can't think of a game that I would play via cloud or on handheld that, you know, I would really be craving. I mean, 144 frames per second is nice on anything, but 
for some reason, the first game that comes to mind is Temtem because I know on the Switch it's like it runs at like 30 FPS on the Switch. Like being able to play that handheld because it's a game I would like to play handheld. Um, being able to play that handheld at um, at at least 60 would be really nice. And I know I know the uh, Steam Deck can achieve that, but I'm not sure if it can achieve 144 frames per second on that game. Um, <clears throat> But anyway, there's a uh, there's a Twitter link to a video, which I'm not gonna watch because I've seen it before and it's very short. But based on the teaser video, uh, it seems like the f uh, Edge 5G may have some sort of adaptive trigger system. Design wise, it looks like the company's Kishi V2 controller. Never seen that. Um, except instead of a place to slot your phone into, the computer and screen are built in. Hmm. Obviously, the elephant in the room is the Steam Deck. Okay, which can be both, uh, which can both stream and play PC games very, uh, competently, on its own. Okay, so that confirms it for me. So the Steam Deck can stream games as well. Okay, so it's, it's two in one. That's crazy. Um, letting you access a good chunk of the Steam library, it's a big advantage of Valve's handheld one. <laughs> Uh, it's sorry. It's a big advantage of Valve's handheld one that Razer's likely won't have, given that it's running Android instead of Steam OS. However, the Steam Deck starts at three ninety nine, and you could uh, only do Wi Fi, not five G. So there's some room for Razer and Verizon to play with here. If the handheld comes in around two hundred fifty dollars, it could be compelling to the same types of people who bought the Nvidia Shield handheld. Verizon's consumer chief operating officer, Krista Bourne. Said she wasn't allowed to give me more detail than what was teased on stage. That meant details about pricing or what exactly Verizon's role in the handheld was. We know it'll be able to access 5G ultra wideband in some way, which could provide for fast downloads and even let you stream more casual games. But it's unclear whether it'll be exclusive to Verizon's network. It's likely we'll have to wait for Razer's official announcement for more details. Obviously. <laughs> wait until RazorCon, guys. Was it announced at RazorCon? No, October fifteenth is RazorCon. Get it right, Glee. Come on. <clears throat> so, I guess listeners, what do you guys think? Razor, five G gaming handheld. What do we think? You know, now that I'm thinking about the Steam Deck again, because for some reason I've like erased it from my memory. Because I think when it came out, it was like on back order for like well for well into a year. Are they readily available now? I didn't even know these things start at three ninety nine. I should get one. I should just forget about buying. I should just forget about buying a Switch OLED and just get a Steam Deck. See now, 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 now I'm curious. I got my own self curious while I'm recording a box. Hold on. We got to do some quick research. Are Steam Decks available right now? Oh. Log in for reservations. I'm looking at... Oof. I'm looking at... Expected order availability September to December 2022. Sheesh. Sheesh. I guess my only issue with this is like, what would I really play on this? And am I am I really not home enough to warrant getting this? Because I don't even play my Switch in handheld mode. Like, I, I just don't. So it's like, this would be nice to have, but I could only think of like a couple games that I would probably play on it. And on top of that, you need Wi-Fi. But this is something I would like. It is something I would like. Steam Deck, uh, yeah. I haven't even been thinking about this thing, which is, which is so funny, honestly. But... Anyway, I'll keep you guys posted on the Verizon handheld, the 5G gaming handheld, October 15th. So that's in a couple weeks from now. And uh, I'm sure once full details are revealed, um, I'll talk about it a little bit more on what it will be probably episode three of this podcast. So moving on into our next uh, news point today. Got a little bit of sad stuff, a little bit of sad news, um, depending on how you look at it. Also from The Verge, Google is shutting down Stadia. Yeah. That's it. <laughs> I don't know what else to say. I don't know what else to say. Maybe I'll keep this one a little bit brief. But Google is shutting down Stadia 
It's cloud gaming service. The service will remain live for players until January 18th, 2023. Google will be refunding all Stadia hardware purchased through the Google Store as well as the games and add-on content purchased from the Stadia Store. Google expects those refunds will be completed mid-January. So, I mean, I mean, at the very worst, right, like, at least you get your money back. Obviously, you don't get your money back for purchasing the thing, but, um, you know, they weren't that expensive to begin with. But this is just, like, I mean, this is just another cloud streaming thing, right? Like, I'm telling you, it, it's, it just doesn't seem like, it just doesn't seem like we're ready yet. Like, it doesn't seem like people, it doesn't seem like people want this sort of service. It it just really doesn't. Like, if there's any, I hear about all of Xbox's service. I hear about people are crazy about all of them, except for the streaming, the cloud gaming one. Same thing goes for PlayStation platform. What was it? PlayStation Now? Is that the streaming service they have? Nobody wants that. Nobody wants that. People have made it clear they don't want that. It doesn't even work well. We want, we want, we want to be able to own our games. We want digital copies, physical copies of our games. We don't want to have to stream the stuff. As a matter of fact, it'd be nice if we can go on if we could play them without having to go connect to the internet to play them, at least for single player games. Um, but to uh, dig a little bit further into this article, I guess a few years ago, we also launched a consumer gaming service, Stadia. Stadia Vice President and GM Phil Harrison said in a blog post, and while Stadia's approach to streaming games for consumers was built on a strong uh, technology foundation, it hasn't gained the traction with users that we expected, so we've made the difficult decision to begin winding down our Stadia streaming service. Employees on the Stadia team will be distributed uh, distributed to other parts of the company. Harrison says Google sees opportunities to apply Stadia's technology to other parts of Google, like YouTube, Google Play, and its AR efforts. And the company also plans to make it available to our industry partners, which align with where we see the future of gaming headed. He wrote. Um, so yeah, the article goes on to talk a little bit how the uh, refund process is going to work. Um, and then towards the end here, we see last year rumors abounded. It would shut down after the number of games released to the platform slowed and the company shuttered its in-house uh shuttered its in-house game development studios when those rumors popped up again this year google insisted that stadia was not shutting down rest assured we're always working bringing more games to the platform and stadia pro the company said in a tweet which was true until today and um (laughs) this article just uh (laughs) It just got. It just has me thinking about the main talking point, which uh, which we're gonna be talking about today in a little bit. Um, oh, it's got me a little worried. It got me a little worried. Not gonna lie. But uh, honestly, this doesn't affect me at all. Um, I've never been interested in Stadia. Never cared. But I feel bad for. Uh, the people who worked on it, you know, it sucks to work a, lo- so a long time on, you know, a hardware gaming platform like this and just, you know, especially when, especially when, you know, you got the head company saying, oh yeah, don't worry, it's not going anywhere, guys, it's here to stay, and boom, just like that, <laughs> just psych, though honestly, I feel like they probably knew before any of us that this was going to happen, so way before, so honestly, they were probably informed, but, you know, PR statements, all that stuff. Um, but yeah, just just goes to show, I don't really know, actually, that's, that's that, that, yeah, I don't really know how these uh, handheld cloud gaming devices are going to go, man, I just... I don't know, Razor. You guys sure? You sure you want to invest in this? It's just, it's too early, man. It's too early. I'm even surprised that VR has been, I guess, carrying its weight as well as it has been, because even though I don't own my own VR device yet, I still feel like it's VR is just too early. It's too early. It's just not there yet. The technology. I, I sometimes can't even understand why people would like 
invest in one. Literally, the only reason why I quote unquote want one is because I stream and it makes for good, funny content. That's about it. Like, if I was not a streamer, I would not, I, I wouldn't even think twice about getting a VR device at this point. I, I really wouldn't. But anyway, moving on. RIP Google Stadia. You will be missed among some. Among some. Moving on, we got some good news, though. Um, actually, everything else is good news. <laughs> We're done with the bad news. Everything else is good news. We could sort of breeze through the rest of these here, uh, most likely. Uh, so we got some E3 news up ahead. Um, so earlier this year, E3 uh, was announced to be returning in 2023. Uh, what it, it took a two-year break, right? 2020, it was... Yeah, it took a break in 2020 and in 2021. And yeah, 2019 E3 was okay. I have to, like, remember because it feels like forever ago, but I will never forget E3 2019 because that's when Animal Crossing New Horizons was revealed. I'll never forget that. So, yeah. So, I mean, it was gone for two years. Like, uh, was E3 ever really... Well, that's right, because they did go through that little period where, like, I don't think it was bankruptcy. What was it? Like, they were going to get bought out or something? They got bought out, right? Something like that. I can't even remember. It feels like so long ago. But, I mean, really, I guess in all honesty, it stopped because of the pandemic. It didn't really stop because it, didn't really stop because it wasn't doing well. I mean, it's definitely, I don't even know. I don't even know. I shouldn't speak on it because I'm not 100% sure. But I would like to think that it would probably be wasn't doing that bad. Maybe not as well as it used to be doing. Like, obviously, uh, for a lot of people say that, you know, E3 sort of fell off around, what, after 2010? Started to fall off quite a bit. Um, even, as a, uh, even as a live viewer for E3, like, I used to sit and watch all the E3 live shows. I'm talking when IGN used to do theirs, when GameSpot. I used to watch that stuff start to finish every day of E3, all the press conferences. And, yeah, it, I mean, it just doesn't feel like it has that same spark anymore. Um, but that just that's probably just because, you know, information comes out so much faster nowadays and, like, You've got announcements and reveals happening all year round. It's not really the main big thing anymore just because of how often companies are just announcing stuff. Nobody's really savoring things for E3 like they used to. And on top of that, everybody has their own shows. But, you know, as an actual uh, attendee, I can't really speak on it because I've never been to E3. Um, <clears throat> but anyway, we have a little bit of information on next year's E3, which is, you know, their return. Uh, it's going to be taking place June 13th through the 16th at the Los Angeles Convention Center with separated business and consumer days and areas, which is very interesting. We're going to jump into this. This article is by Games Industry. So this week, the E3 team is sending in its plan for the show to the games industry. Um, I'm going to skip through this beginning a little bit. The E3 physical event will take place from Tuesday, June 13th to Friday, June 16th at the Los Angeles Convention Center. It's a business and consumer show. The first two days are only for the business. The third day is a business slash consumer show, while the fourth day is purely for consumers. The team had themselves quite a few lofty goals with E3, as you may remember, but the three, day, uh, but the three core objectives are make a better business event, where it's easier to connect, meet, and conduct interviews, make a better consumer experience, where there are things for fans to actually do, partner, support, and be friends with everyone announcing games in and around E3, irrespective of whether they're actually in the convention center. I think that's a big one for sure because, you know, <clears throat> as we know, everybody's sort of doing their own thing now. Nintendo, uh, while they no longer do press conferences... I think the last one they did was the last E3 one they did was 20 was it 2012? Uh, I think it was 2011. I think 2011 was no, it had to have been 2012. I believe it was 2012. Yeah, it was 2012 was the last time they were actually like took the stage. 
Um, ever since then, they've done E3 directs, but nothing actual physically on the stage. And then you have a couple of other companies who are also doing their own things now. Um, which, you know, being able to, um, being able to support those other companies still, even though they may not be a part of your main show is, I think it's a huge deal. You want to make sure you build healthy relationships going forward with these companies and partners, um, because you never know when they might feel like, uh, coming back into the fold. Um, <clears throat> but the article continues to say this is how the team is going to try and deliver on that. One half of the LACC will be entirely dedicated to business, featuring quieter, more comfortable booths with areas to connect and network and grab a coffee. The hope is to reopen, uh, is it Kentia? Kentia Hall. And again, this will be exclusive for business attendees. The other half will be the spec, uh, spectacular E3 that you're used to. And for the first two days, this will also be for business attendees only. On top of that, there will be a new dedicated meeting space where attendees can connect using the E3 app, more on that later, and hold meetings, of course. You can still um, pop over to the Marriott and catch up there, but now you don't have to. Interesting. This already sounds better. This already sounds so much better. And wow, I'm just realizing how long of an article this is. Um, and finally, this is where game uh, gamesindustry.biz comes in. Uh, this is the website, which, which the article is written by. Business folks will receive data, insight, interviews, and analysts direct to their inboxes and in print before, after, and during the show. <clears throat> so that's some of the business improvements. When it comes to the fans, E3 will invite consumers into their halls on Thursday and Friday. The show will also be more accessible for indies and indie publishers. That's very good. That's huge. That's huge to showcase titles in the uh, concourse hall, which will also be open to gamers. In addition, the team is planning to uh, is planning elements outside of the LACC plus numerous game presentations that fans can watch in person or online during those two final or during those final two days. So <clears throat> that's pretty much it. Um, so we know E3 now is being managed by Reed Pop, I believe, and the ESA. Um, Reed Pop is PAX, the same people who I believe, I don't know if it's managed or like if it's ran through, I, I don't really know how that stuff works, but I know Reed Pop and PAX are also affiliated with each other, uh, pretty heavily. So I'm not sure, are the same people running E3 also running PAX now? Because if so, that's a, that's a huge deal. That's a huge deal. Um, I don't think, <laughs> I'm thinking crazy, but... Wouldn't it be wild if E3 just became, like, the new PAX Prime? Like, wouldn't that be insane if it became the new PAX Prime? Because there is not a PAX in, in California. There's only... How many PAXs are there now? There's only two... There's three PAXs. There's three main show PAXs, which is PAX Australia, PAX East, and PAX West, which was formerly PAX Prime. Um... And I feel like PAX Prime should still be a thing. There should still be one PAX that's like, okay, if you're going to go to a PAX, if you, if you can only go through to one PAX a year, this should be the one. That would be crazy if E3 essentially turned into that. That would be wild. I mean, that's something crazy I would like to see. But, I mean, that's sort of been my, um, that's sort of been my, uh, my feeling for lack of a better word um, about this whole entire situation since uh, s since the downfall of E3 I guess is that this, the, the convention needs to be more like PAX and for people who are spending all of this money to go to these E3s it's like why are you guys not going to PAX like I keep telling people over and over again like PAX is where PAX is where you want to be the amount of stuff that you can do at PAX for free and like the locations that they're held in, how easy it is to get around. It's insane that people are skipping out on PAX. Like you've got people going to freaking conventions, events way out in the middle of nowhere. It's like, just go to a PAX. I'm telling you, it's going to be the best time of your life if you go to a PAX. Um, <clears throat> But I won't lie, though, this new E3 information is uh, kind of getting me excited. Like, 
before I die, it would be nice to go to at least one E3. But the but from what I've heard in the past, it's just like a complete, <laughs> a complete freaking mosh pit of a show. Especially ever since you know they've sort of they've sort of combined uh, consumers and you know actual uh, journalists and uh, you know actual uh, industry employees into one building. I've heard it's just it just became a huge mess. But now that they sort of have these separate days, it sounds like a lot more organized and a lot more cleaner of a show. And um, yeah, I would I would love to go to E three and like you know sit down at a press conference and report on the games and write stuff up. Like, I've always wanted to do that. I've always wanted to do that at least once. At least once. I could see how that could be really stressful, but I've always wanted to do that at least once. Um, and now with these separate days, I would like to do it even more because I don't have to worry about, oh, I'm trying to get to this place. But, oh, God, so many people. Oh, what do these people do? Oh, it smells, smells in here. But like now we have like everything split and organized. Sounds a lot nicer. Um so yeah, we'll see what happens. Definitely them making room for indie developers is huge. Um, because that was one thing that I feel like E three didn't have. It's always been like this triple A this triple A gaming show with very little room for indie to, you know, to indie to spread their wings. But now now it seems like they're making a valiant effort to uh, allow them a space, which is very good because that's essentially what PAX that's essentially what PAX is is uh is quickly becoming actually has been becoming since I don't even know I guess since 2016 maybe even before because I know PAX South uh, which was in uh, I think it was San Antonio um, no was it San Antonio no what was PAX South PAX South was um, oh now I have to look it up <laughs> because I'm never going to remember PAX South uh, I know it was in Texas, but where in Texas? Uh, this is going to bother me so much. This is going to bother me so much if I don't, like, remember. Oh, it was in San Antonio. It was in San Antonio. Okay. So, yeah, PAX South in San Antonio, Texas was, um, was sort of known as the PAX that really was catered to indie indie developers. It was at the beginning of the year, so it was in like January. Um, I believe all of them were in January, end of January. And so, you know, that's coming off the holiday season. That's coming off of, you know, all the big releases for, you know, that, uh, I guess, f uh, fiscal year for a lot of companies, you know, because most of them drop their biggest titles during the holiday. And then at the beginning of the year, it's kind of quiet. But, you know, indie there's stuff happening all the time. So PAX South sort of served as like that purpose for, you know, it sort of served as that uh, room for just indie developers to flood in and share what they're working on. It was like the indie show for PAX because, you know, obviously you had, <clears throat> you had PAX East, which is, you know, uh, sort of, sort of the start of the new fiscal year. Cause it usually takes place in like end of March, uh, and like at the late, I think at the earliest, sometimes it takes place in February, but usually it's like March to sometime mid April. And then you have, um, you know, you have companies that are fiscal year sort of ending around that time. So you have, you know, some newly announced titles might show up some summer, uh, summer titles that are going to be dropping might show up there. And then, PAX West or what was formerly PAX Prime was always in September, August, and that's fresh out of E3. So then you have some E3 demos from these AAA games being brought to PAX, uh, PAX West. Um, and so it's like there's very little room for um, very little room for indie uh, at that point in time. Now it's like I think all of the PAXs now do a very good job at uh, having a space for indie. Like they do a crazy good job. And even though there is there has been less triple A uh titles and companies, you know, at these um at these packs as well the past couple of years because obviously we had COVID, so there was no packs in um there was no packs in twenty twenty. And then I think twenty twenty one PAX West returned, but PAX East was not happening. Uh, PAX yeah, I think PAX unplugged and PAX West were the only packs 
uh, events to take place in 2021, so last year, and there weren't that many uh, AAA developers. And then PAX East uh, 2022, which is the one I went to, I don't think I can't even I don't even think there was a single like triple like Microsoft was not there, Sony was not there, Nintendo was not there, Square Enix was not there. It was mostly all indie, which was cool. It was still a decently sized show, but there was a lot missing. It was mostly indie tabletop, to be very honest with you. Um, and then I heard, or rather I know, that PAX West this year, that just happened this past month. Um, things are starting to slowly return to normal. Um, Nintendo was at um, Nintendo was at the uh, PAX West that just recently happened, and I heard they put on a pretty big show. Uh, with Splatoon, with a Splatoon three tournament, there was a Smash Brothers Ultimate Invitation, or no, it was not an invitation. It was an open ten thousand dollar open that took place. Um, and uh, I don't think Microsoft or Sony were there, but I think there were uh, some other bigger companies that were absent from this year's PAX East. So things are returning to normal. But I guess circling back around to my original point, um, for sure, if E three wants to sort of get at this point, get on the level that PAX is. Um, they've really got to open their arms up to uh, to the indie community for sure because that's such a huge part of the gaming scene, it's a huge part of the industry now. It's like you can't, you literally can't ignore it. I mean, look at Summer Games Fest. Look at um, the Game Awards. There's something to be talking about in a second here. All of these, all of these shows now, they they cater to indie so much, <clears throat> and it's just because there's so much there. It's it's evolved into this incredible scene, this incredible new addition to. Um, the gaming community something I didn't care about <laughs> to be very honest to begin with but now I have so much respect for because um, they are really our saving grace because she's you know some of these companies are just going to absolute shit anyway uh, moving on past the E3 topics so that's what's happening with E3 there will be n- more news on E3 for sure uh, you know probably as we move into next year uh, it's probably going to be the next batch of E3 information so I will be staying staying tuned for that because you never know. You never know what might happen. I, I got to make it to an E3 before I die or before I get too old someday. So um, it's on the uh, it's on the old goalpost. But uh, moving on, like I said, we're going to talk about the Game Awards for a second. Just very quickly, um, Game Awards 2022 is happening on December 8th at the Microsoft Theater. Tickets are going live on November 1st. Um, so, yeah. This has sort of become the brand new tradition, I guess, since 2019, 2018. It's the Game Awards now. Um, it's like it, it's, you know, it's an award show and it's like an announcement show all in one. Some pretty big titles have been announced at past Game Awards. So um, definitely expect that. I feel like this year has been pretty quiet as far as announcements go. So I'm really interested to see what some of these companies have up their sleeve for this show. Like I'm still waiting on... Psh- I'm still waiting on Microsoft to talk about... I'm still waiting for them to talk about Fable 4. I'm still waiting for Netherrealm to talk about Mortal Kombat 12 because we know that's coming. Um, Yeah. I mean, there's there's a lot of stuff that we have just yet to hear about in full. So I'm really looking forward to some of these uh, remaining shows for this year. This is like the last one that usually happens um, during the years, the game awards now. So that should be interesting. And, uh, actually one important thing to touch on real quickly, um, <clears throat> is that that NVIDIA leak, I believe that came out, uh, which had the, uh, dates, some important dates for some of these upcoming games, most notably Diablo four in that leak was said to have its pre-purchased announced at the game awards on December 8th. And at that time, I don't think we had an official day for the Game Awards. Um, I don't think we did. I don't think we knew whether or not it was happening on December 8th. But now, these these two sort of things coincide with each other. So I think it's a pretty safe bet that Diablo 4, we're going to get a concrete release date for Diablo 4 at the Game Awards. And probably... Uh, the pre-purchase will go live. I don't really know how big of a deal that is unless they're planning on doing like an, a closed beta or something. Who cares? Who cares about pre-purchase? I think people, uh, I think Blizzard fans are, uh, yeah, I think that sort of fan base has sort of learned now, A, don't pre-purchase anything. <laughs> uh, try the beta first. Do what you can before you pre-order because, you know, they've been pushing out a lot of dog doo-doo lately so 
Um, yeah. Anyway, last announcement I want to touch on today very quickly. This one is uh, probably something that most of you aren't going to care about. It's not really huge industry breaking news. Just something more on my personal radar. If you're a fan of fighting games, I would say this is a pretty big deal because it has just been yearned for for the longest possible time. And that is Guilty Gear Exerd slash Revelator 2 is going to be getting rollback. That's right. It's freaking happening. Can you believe it? I cannot believe it. I can't believe it. We're only one year fresh out of Strive, Guilty Gear Strive, and rollback is already coming to Guilty Gear Exert slash Revelator 2. It's insane. I didn't think... I think a lot of people thought it wasn't going to happen because they want to push Strive as much as possible. I think that was everybody's original, like, you know, that was everybody's original sentiment. Is, oh, it's not going to happen because they're going to, it's going to ruin Strive sales if they advertise their older game that everybody likes more. But they're doing it. It's crazy. They're doing it. Guilty Gear Exert is probably one of the most beloved uh, anime fighters in the entire like scene right now and the fact that this is getting rollback is huge it's huge like i'm talking about this is almost on par this is almost on par uh with with uh the notion of street fighter 4 getting rollback if it were possible <laughs> it's almost on that level that's how big of a deal this is it's crazy like so many people have wanted this it's insane um but anyway the open beta test is coming late october so if you want to help uh, try out the uh, new rollback net code. Report your findings and your experience to developers so they can make sure this is good as possible. Make sure you do that. Important note, though, the rollback update is only coming to PC. Um, I don't think financially it makes any sense for them to invest in uh, in the console platforms at this point because that would mean they would also have to tinker with the PS3 version of the game, uh, which, you know... This is basically a completely obsolete platform at this point. Um, and PS4 likely will soon be as well uh, within the next year or so. But, um, yeah, it's uh, PC boys only, but really, get a PC. Like, it's 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 the platform to play fighting games on now. If you're still on console for fighting games, doing yourself a disservice. I get console probably has a lot bigger of a player base still. But it's just crazy, like, you guys move to PC, it's so much more free. Outside of all the bugs that be happening, because for some reason, developers can't optimize PC versions of games. Um, once they get that stuff figured out, PC is the place to be for fighting games, for sure. For sure. Now, shooters, I wish I could say the same for shooters, but geez, these hackers be crazy, man. They be crazy. That's wild, right? Like, how are you going to play a shooter without a keyboard or mouse, but... Shit, I'll take controller all day if I don't have to deal with hackers. <laughs> but no, even still, I still play my, my shooters on um, on PC. So anyway, that wraps up all the news talking points for this week. That is our news update. I know that was pretty long. That was pretty long. I'll probably end up cutting it down to like four <laughs> four things. Or that, sorry, not four, three things. Uh, tops. Um or my three biggest announcements and try and run through them a little bit faster because that did take up a pretty good chunk of time, but it's okay. It's okay. Um, now, moving into this next segment here, I don't really know if I want this to be an official segment going forward, but it is something that I think uh, I'm going to want to touch on anyway, especially as we move into uh, the end of the year here in the holiday season. That's notable gaming deals for the week. I bring you guys some good deals because I'm good at finding this stuff. I feel like I feel like I always share this this kind of stuff with people who just don't care. Um, but hey, if you're all about saving money, I think I'm willing to help you out. I'm willing to do some digging for you guys. I'm willing to do some digging for you guys, honestly. Um, so I'm gonna touch on this real quick before we get into today's main talking point. Today's main meat and potatoes of the podcast uh, is some gaming deals. I got a couple of years. So the first off kick one of the probably the biggest one honestly is um pretending the xbox series x now i should probably check because things change i almost shouldn't check so like if it's changed at the time that i'm recording this uh, i don't want to be a liable <laughs> but i think let me see oh uh, no it's still there it's still there it's still there but the sale ends soon 
the sale ends soon and I'm <laughs> and I'm up I'm updating this this podcast. I'm uploading this immediately after I'm done to the YouTube. So uh I think there should be enough time to dig into the sale, but let me stop let me stop teasing you. So the Microsoft Xbox Series X is currently available on Newegg right now. Sale in soon for four hundred and twenty four dollars. Four hundred and twenty four dollars, dude. That's like what, like a little over a hundred dollars more than the Series S. The Series S is two ninety nine, right? Or it was. I think it's a little bit cheaper than that now. But still four hundred and twenty four dollars. Now there's a catch, obviously, but it's not a huge deal. As a matter of fact, I've been seeing so much misinformation regarding this when it first got announced earlier in the week. I've been seeing so much in- misinfo and people trying to dis- uh, uh, dissuade others from from copping this deal, and that's that you have to pay. You have to pay through Zip. Now, if you're not familiar with Zip, Zip is shop online now, pay over time sort of service. They split the purchase amount into four interest-free payments spread over six weeks. Um, All you got to do is choose Zip at checkout, use your debit or credit card, no long forms and instant approval, and pay in four installments. Um, It's literally just like PayPal Pay Later or PayPal Pay in Four. It's the exact same thing. It's just a different company. There is zero there is zero reason to worry about this or worry about it being a scam. You're not paying any interest at all. There's no added interest. It's just an option to pay in for. It's just uh, it's just a way for people to get the get to it's just basically a trial for their service. They want people to try their service. They want people to give it a shot because then they could potentially get you to use the 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 other the other offerings or the other um the other uh, financing options, which do charge you interest, but this one in particular, the paying for it in particular, does not. So don't worry about that. I'm telling you, you want a Series X for cheap? Get this because I don't even think I I I think it's <laughs> I think it's uh um very unlikely that this goes to a similar price during Black Friday. I don't think it's gonna happen. Four hundred dollars is dirt cheap for an Xbox Series X, brand spanking new. Um, I think maybe four fifty is probably a likely price that you'll see during Black Friday, maybe. But even now, I think it might be too early for these consoles to get discounted. So we'll see what happens. But hop on this, hop on this deal before it ends, before they sell out. I feel like an idiot for not doing it myself, but I just really don't need an Xbox. <laughs> like I just really don't. I can't think of a single reason why I w- I want one to have one. It's a nice looking console. I just really don't need one for literally any reason. I just don't. I guess maybe to play Halo <laughs> because Halo on PC has just been a shit show <laughs> for the longest time. It's so unoptimized still, uh, infinite. But um, other than that, I don't need this system at all. Hopping into the next deal though, real quickly, and this is the last one is um Nintendo Switch. I should probably make sure this is still available before I talk about it. Um, and this is another very good deal, though not as not nearly as good as um that Series X deal. Please, for the love of God, hop on that deal. Hop on that deal. And oh, it looks like right now it's not available, but I feel like this is a deal that's going to come back in stock, so I will mention it anyway. And that is the Nintendo Switch is or was available on Amazon for two hundred and ninety one dollars. Now this is the Nintendo Switch OLED White uh, edition, um, and this has been a deal that's been going on for the past couple weeks actually, because this was live last week too. And I believe when I checked last week, they had the neon red and the white in stock. Um, there's a catch to this also, and that's that it ships from the UK. Um, so it's gonna take a. a a week or so, a couple weeks, I think, to arrive. I believe when I was checking, I checked the deal last night. It was still there for the white switch, uh, the white uh, OLED switch. Um, and I think the earliest delivery was the 7th of October. And I think um, free shipping, I think the earliest was like the 11th through the 19th it might arrive. So, I mean, if you can wait a couple weeks, it's definitely a really good deal. You're saving yourselves like 50 plus bucks, so... I would definitely hop on that. Like I said, I think this is one that's going to come back in stock because um, it's been available for like the past two weeks, and I'm assuming they just run out of stock and replenish. So I think this might be one that's going to be around for a little bit longer. 
uh, because there is a catch to it, and that's that uh, it ships from uh, the UK. So keep an eye up, keep an eye out on that one. Literally, you could find both these deals by just searching up the consoles on their respective websites. So just search up Xbox Series X on Newegg, click on the page, and uh, if you don't see anything that says uh, sale and soon, uh, if you don't see sale and soon. Uh, beneath the price tag, the four ninety nine price tag on Newegg, that means the sale is over. And uh, if you search up Am- uh, Nintendo Switch on Amazon and you don't see the two ninety one uh, Switch OLED, that means that it's out of stock, or I guess the sale is over. Um. So, oh, actually, oh wait, no, never mind. Uh, the, I I did. Fi- oh yeah, I did find the page for um. I found the page for the... It's still in stock, yeah. It's still in stack, stock for the Nintendo Switch OLED White on Amazon. I had to scroll down a little bit. But yeah, this is legit, so it's official. It It's 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 shipped uh, from the Nintendo Switch store on Amazon. And uh, yeah, so $2.92 um, in stock. The OLED, the OLED Neon Red, Neon Blue is not, but the OLED White is. And free delivery, for me personally, free delivery Tuesday, October 16th, or 18th, sorry, or fast delivery Monday, October 10th. So there you go. It's still there. Two ninety two. dollars Getting yourself a good $50 discount on a Switch OLED if you want one. Would be nice for Pokemon when it comes out, right? So that's going to be it for the deals for this week. Hopefully that helps you guys out a little bit. Um, I'm going to close out all of this other stuff because I have so many tabs from all of these, all of these, oops, I did not need to close out that one from all of these posts and whatnot open. And, um, we're going to jump into our talking point for today. <clears throat> Had to get a quick sip. Talking nonstop is... This is unedited, you guys, okay? I could talk for this long. I could talk for this. I don't even know how long this has been going, but I could talk for a long time. Trust me. I could do it. And I'm not even that caffeinated. I could talk for a very, very long time, which is good. Because this discussion, I feel like I'm going to go ranting for uh, for quite a while. So today's talking point. Now, obviously, uh, before I dive into this, I want to say that, yes, I feel like every podcast should have a main talking point. Something... Uh, central that you get to either at the end of the show or before the end of the show. That's sort of the overall focal point of the podcast. And, you know, I think everything, every show sort of has a uh, main category or subject that they discuss on for that given week. This week, I want to talk about something that has been in the gaming news in the past, uh, even sort of in the present now, and probably will be... uh, quite a bit going forward from now most likely because I have a sinking feeling that you know some of the more unfortunate things are probably on the horizon for this entity but today we'll be talking about the trials and tribulations of the G4 TV reboot now this is something I would have loved to go ham into on my personal stream but uh, to be very honest, I don't think half of anybody who watches me, <laughs> I don't think anybody who watches my streams uh, pays attention to G4 or even cares. Like, uh, I know I have quite a few uh, young followers on Twitch, and I know G4 for a lot of them was probably before their time, or they're just, it's definitely not something they would be into or probably would have been into growing up. But for me, like, G4 is honestly a huge, like, they are a huge, um, how do I say this? They are, I don't want to say inspiration, maybe I could say inspiration, but I guess they were a huge inspiration uh, as far as me getting into a lot of the more um, content creation, uh, journalistic side of, uh, you know, the video game scene. Um, Even now, even even, uh, this podcast that I'm doing now, like I would say that uh, listening to Vibe Check and seeing Vibe Check and seeing the loop back in action just you know gave me a lot more motivation the freaking start of podcast i feel like g4 has inspired me a lot um throughout their time of being around it's crazy um so hearing all this news and following them since the reboot which uh i guess officially took place last year in november so almost a one-year anniversary 
hearing all the stuff, just uh, all, all everything that's been happening since then and up until now, it's just made me want to talk about them even even more, even more. And honestly, it's probably good that it's just me talking about this today, no co hosts is because uh, this is something I wanted to rant about for quite a long time uh, because a lot has just been happening and there's just a lot on my mind regarding this entity that has a very special place in my heart. Very special place in my heart. So, um... I'm going to walk you guys through it real quick. So uh, if you don't know what G4 TV is, basically the most bare, because they've had a very, they have a very confusing history as far as how they got started. But basically they were a, um, basically I believe they were a Spike TV. Uh, were they a Spike TV? Was it, were they Spike TV first? Basically a TV on cable television that centered around, uh, video game news and sort of video game culture, stuff like that. Um, you know, they had different uh, different shows, different segments, sort of catering to uh, a different category, which within, you know, the nerd sphere, if I can say that. So they've had uh, segments pertaining to comic books. Um, they had X-Play or Extended Play, whichever you might know them by, which, is, which was more, you know, video game news and reviews um, and skits and stuff like that. They had Attack of the Show. Uh, which is sort of, um, which was their daily show, really. It was more of, uh, I don't even want to call it, it was, how do I even describe Attack of the Show? How do I describe AOTS? It's very hard to describe, because while they did focus on tech a little bit, I believe their slogan was, uh, we're TV's, what was it? We're TV's show for all the things you care about. So they had everything from, uh, featuring uh, movie celebrities. They talk about movies. They talk about new TV shows. They talked about uh, new phones, new sort of gadgets and tech. They talked about, uh, even they mentioned they talked about games sometimes. Um, they talked about comic books on the show too. They covered web videos and just crazy viral stuff on the web. Um, it was crazy. They did everything on that show. They did so much. And it was, it was a daily show. It was weeknights. It was five days a week. Um, uh, but it was a but it was a huge part of G4 TV, and also, um, some of you guys might know uh, Ninja Warrior or Sasuke. I believe it's what it was called in Japan. I think it was called Sasuke in Japan, and uh, it was Ninja Warrior, American Ninja Warrior, uh, over in the West. That was also something that was uh broadcasted and debuted on G4, I believe. Uh, so you could always find the new seasons and whatnot first on G4 TV, and of course. We all know that, you know, later down the line, the channel slowly went and they sort of started dying down a little bit on content in order to pay for the operations and everything. They ran a lot of reruns of cops and cheaters, which cheaters I don't really know too much about, but cops, like, yeah, it was known as like the, I, I guess you could say the 12-hour cop channel or 16-hour cop channel and like everything else was like mostly G4-related content. Um, but, you know, around 2012, I think 2013, is when they went off air, um, and a lot of the uh, a lot of the main faces who were with the company sort of uh, went to other companies. They got jobs uh, in other places. I think most notable is probably Olivia Munn, who was uh, one of the hosts on Attack of the Show. I think up until twenty eleven, uh, maybe it was twenty ten. It was twenty ten because yeah, I think she left first, right? Olivia Munn left first before Kevin Pereira left. They were like the two main hosts of the show, but obviously, uh, over time, both of them left. But I think Olivia left first. And um, where was I going with this? Oh yeah, so like as you know now, Olivia Munn is like a huge celebrity, huge celebrity. Uh, she was in I think one of her most notable roles is uh, is it Psylocke in one of the X Men movies? I think it was Psylocke. Psylocke, right? I think so. I can't remember. I can't remember what hero she played, but I mean, yeah, that was a huge role, and um. Yeah, she's basically a full-fledged celebrity now, but, you know, you have other people who have went on to do other things and uh, be heads of other projects, but, um, so that happened around 2013, and, you know, basically everything went dark for that long, and in 2020, they did, in uh, the fall of 2020, how did this happen, like, I have to remember, I think it was actually the beginning of 2020, it had to have been around March I think it was around March. G four, 
uh, whether they made new social media accounts. So they used the old one. I don't remember, but they took the social media and they released a teaser, which was, um, <laughs> it it was sort of like a very ominous teaser. And at the end, it had like an old school TV, and it sort of played their uh, logo animation, and then a um, and then that little classic G four sound bite, um. And like that, that's when we knew, oh, it's they're coming back one way or another. We'd never stop playing. That was sort of their, that was sort of their logo. That was sort of the thing that they did. And um, so yeah, that was in 2020. And then it was kind of quiet from then, uh, from there. And then around, I believe it was November of 2020. They re- they they broadcasted live on their Twitch channel. And on YouTube, a reunion, a G4 reunion, which had all the old, like most of pretty much all the old cast, all the old hosts, and sitting around a, uh, a Thanksgiving table sort of reminiscing the old times of the network. And I think at that point it was clear, like, okay, yes, G4 TV is coming back. Um, we weren't sure exactly what they were going to be doing or when they were launching, who would be a part of it, who wasn't. Um, but shortly after that, they came out with more details. I think they did... Uh, a few like promotional. They did quite a bit of promotional stuff. They had like a D uh, a limited D and D show with like some pretty big celebrities. They did um, they did some Among Us streams with uh, celebrities and some of the old co hosts. And then, um, I believe it was around January. I think January of twenty twenty one was when they started announcing who was going to be a part of certain things. That's when we started uh, finding out who's going to be the hosts on which show, which shows were coming back. We knew X Play was coming back. We knew Attack of the Show was coming back, um, and then we knew uh, some other stuff was in the works as well. Uh, uh, Invitation the Party, which is like a TTRPG, um, D and D style um, uh, show that they did last year which is really cool and grew on me a lot. And I'm sad because there hasn't been a season two. And at this point, I don't think there's going to be a season two, even though they sort of tease a season two last year when the whole thing ended. But uh, at this point, I really don't think it's going to happen. Um, but yeah, they started teasing a ton of content. And in the summer of 2021 is when we really started to uh, get into this reboot with um, the beach house. <laughs> So they, uh, I guess the company, they rented out a, uh, uh, a beach house. Like, okay. It wasn't a beach house. They, they were teasing and advertising it as a, uh, actual beach house stream. But what ended up happening is they, uh, they were in like a, I guess it was an office space, right? Uh, rented out office space and they were doing live streams, very, uh, low budget attack of the show and X play live streams from the beach house and though they weren't called AOTS and they weren't called attack of the show they had their little segments that were kind of hinting like yeah we're coming back to doing this sort of content this is going to be the kind of tone and the kind of stuff you can expect when we come back um the main idea was that they were in the beach house doing the beach house streams it was sort of like a uh um sort of an icebreaker for all the hosts to uh you know get warmed up to the actual start of the whole uh to the whole thing that was going to be taking place later in the year in November. And, um, you know, we found out that, yeah, they're having a brand new studio built in California, which was actually the old studio or wasn't built They were Well, they were building studios inside of the actual building, but the building I believe is actually the, uh, old riot games building. Um, so they took over that one and, um, yeah, I'm really giving you guys the whole timeline here. So, um, they came back in November of 2021 and we had the official launch, the official relaunch, um, shortly after Thanksgiving, I believe. And it was, um, or maybe it was before, I think it was a little bit before Thanksgiving. And we had a lot of things from, you know, the old school days were coming back. We had attack of the show. We had invitation to party. We had vibe check, which was a new, uh, podcast, which is hilarious. A really good vibe, uh, really good, um, podcast show by them. We had the loop which was Kevin Pereira's uh, podcast show where he sort of interviews celebrities, talks about different things, but for the most part, he was just interviewing um, other people involved with the uh, with the uh, reboot at the start, and then we got into some other celebrities over time. Um, and then also we had X-Play, I think I said, and uh, 
Uh, I think those were pretty much it. So it was Exploit, Attack of the Show, Vibe Check, Invitation to the Party, and The Loop. Those were sort of the five shows they started out with. And um, yeah, everything was everything was cool. I think everything was cool uh, with the relaunch. I think I think they relaunched at the perfect time. And I haven't even gotten to like all the bad news and whatnot yet, but I think they relaunched at the perfect time. I think a lot of people will say, oh, um, it was all nostalgia, blah, 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 blah. And I think uh, that is true to a degree. Um, but at the same time, I feel like the industry, the scene, the community as a whole has been starved for content like what G4 has been doing. I don't think people realize it. And at the same time, I don't think people are willing to give it a chance. But I think what they're doing is actually not being done by uh, a lot of the creators, a lot of the uh, entities that we see that are popular on live streaming platforms today, especially within the gaming space. What they're doing is not, it's not, <laughs> it's not that common. People will say, oh, why would I watch this when, you know, I can go to, you know, another popular, like, they're not doing this kind of stuff. They're not. And maybe it is for a good reason. Maybe it's just because, you know, it is expensive having this many people doing all this stuff. Um, but I think there has been a, uh, I think there has been whispers going around that, um, you know, why watch this when I could just watch, you know, somebody else doing the exact same thing on Twitch or YouTube. And it's like, dude, come on. Nobody else is making content like this. Let's be real. No one else is doing anything like no one else is doing anything like Attack of the Show right now. Are you serious? You know nobody's not. Uh, give me one, just one second. Oh, I had to get more tea in me. But anyway, moving on past that. So, uh, like I said, I think they launched at a really good time. We were still sort of, you know, while the pandem pandemic was sort of ending, teetering off a little bit at the end of last year. Um... People are still at home for the most part, especially during the holiday season. They had all those extra views. It was just a really good time to relaunch the network. It was the perfect time, I feel like. <clears throat> um, but well into, you know, I, I feel like well into 2022, even as a person who, I, like, I was paying attention to their numbers. And even as a person who uh, is just really into their content. I definitely could see that they weren't doing very well, especially for how long they were doing it, how stagnant it seemed, um, and the numbers just weren't there. Now, <clears throat> I will say that it seemed like things were getting a lot better, um, especially uh, around, uh, especially as of recently, actually, like as a month ago, um... I know vibe checks were hitting, they went from hitting like 2K live viewers to like 5K for a couple consecutive weeks. And I don't know if that was due to hosts or due to them being on front page, what have you. Um, but I've noticed that vibe check was definitely getting a lot more viewers. And um, yeah, I don't want to talk, I don't want to talk too much about that yet because. Um, I think the most important thing, the most important talking point is to touch on something that happened uh, a lot earlier this year. And I think it was January or February. And um, sort of, uh, I guess, is what a lot of people are convinced is sort of what led to the now seemingly downfall of the network that we're witnessing before our eyes right now. And that is the whole Frostgurin rant. <sighs> I, I I never thought I would be t commenting on this um, because even now, I just don't know how I feel about it. I know for sure uh, because I believe when I watched it, I watched that live, actually. I watched that live. And even when I watched it live, I didn't think it was as big of a deal as people blew it out of proportion uh, like as people, as other people have seen it to be, I guess. Um, but apparently that was the whole turning point for a lot of people. Apparently that really set a lot of people off seemingly. And, um, they stopped watching 
due to that. Now, I'm willing to argue and I'm willing to bet that a lot of people, especially a lot of the content creators now who have been making videos and just farming views off of that particular moment in the in the in the channel's relaunch history, I'm willing to bet that they stopped watching a long time ago, probably after week one or maybe even week two of the reboot. Um, I'm willing to bet that they probably can't even tell me the names of all the hosts on AOT on AOTS. It's always the people who don't watch this stuff to begin with who have the most to say about it. Um, <laughs> like it, it's always them who has the biggest problem. It's like you don't even watch it, so like why do you care? Um, but like at the same time, I can sort of agree with some of the thi- like with with some of the way uh, some of these people may feel. But what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to play that rant very quickly. And uh, just to give myself not only a refresher, but I guess sort of a reset so I can pick out what I felt like was, you know, a little bit out of taste, a little bit weird. And um, also for you guys, for you guys to hear this for the first time if you haven't heard it yet. Um, so I got to dig this out real quick because I thought I had it in my tabs prepped and ready to go. Let it be known. This is just uh, week one, week one, episode one, episode one hiccups. Give me a break. Give me a rest if I can find it here. Here we go. So. Here we go. So uh, if you guys aren't familiar with who Frost Guren even is, basically she is a, I sh- should have brought this up to begin with, but basically she is a host on or was and that's getting into the next thing. She was a host on X Play, um, on the X Play reboot, and but she's originally from the League of Legends community. I believe she's a League of Legends commentator, um, and she's known for her hot takes. <laughs> she's known for you know uh, being sort of passive aggressive on Twitter. Uh, definitely doesn't back down from arguments. Um, basically, just known for her hot takes. Has a hot head. Um, and is sort of that uh, very I'll rough you up type of person has that sort of vibe. Um, so to give you a little pretext, I think they're going to go into it anyway in the video, but to give you a little pretext, a little context on the situation was this statement was made or this rant was made during uh, X-Play where they were going, we were supposed to be talking about Red Dead Redemption, and I'm not sure how much of this was scripted. Um, she claims that she said all this off the top of her head, but I'm really not sure. But by the look of some of the uh, other hosts on the show, it looks like, by the look on their faces, it looks like it was actually <laughs> came completely out of nowhere. But you never know what these people, you never know. Like, they they have meetings for their shows. Like, they usually plan ahead for a lot of the stuff. But I, I feel like this is probably one of these situations where it was actually came completely out of nowhere, especially knowing her. Um, But this was really apparently the turning point for a lot of people and made a lot of people turn a blind eye to uh, the G4 TV reboot and what they're doing now. But um, yeah, let's just jump into this This a little bit of a long rant. So bear with me. But um, we're going to we're going to we're going to roll back the tape a little bit and uh, uh, touch on a little bit where this where this whole downfall started to happen. Oh, my script didn't get put in. That's fine. We. Oh, wait, it's coming in. Coming in hot. The prompter has <laughs> gone. You actually wrote it up ahead of time? Frost, Frost. Frost wrote something. You in expert advance. credit person <laughs> making us all look bad. It's tr- now, just to comment really quickly, when they're they're talking about a script, they're not talking about her rant. They're talking about what she was supposed to talk about regarding Red Dead Redemption. Um, just wanted to throw that out there. True. Can we With get the typing and the writing and the sentence structure and the grammar and the semantics. Yeah, so um, I'll fill while our prompter figures out what it's doing. Uh, producers, it's empty, by the way. Or I'll just speak off the cuff and from my heart. Um, so when this originally happened and my gaming grievance was actually going to be about Red Dead Online. So the subreddit for Red Dead Online, I'm a huge Red Dead Online player. I love Red Dead Redemption 2. I think it's probably my favorite game of all time. And right now, the Red Dead Online community are trying to get this hashtag going called Save Red Dead Online. And they've got it covered by Kotaku, Polygon, um, Game Rants, like Forbes, I think, also did a coverage of it. And they think that this will get Rockstar's attention and Rockstar will come back to them and give them exactly what they want. And we can actually scroll this down. 
I'll tell you when to stop scrolling. Good, stop right there. But I'm here to tell you, and you're gonna have to cut this B-roll in a second, because it's, uh, it's done. And what I think, I do think that there is a larger discussion about Red Dead Online and that we need to have eventually about game design versus immersive experience and comparing the Red Dead Online multiplayer experience versus the solo player one. But I actually wanna talk about something so much more important than Red Dead Online. Sexism in gaming. In joining G4, in, this is not where I thought we were going, I know, but I'm here. Have I'm no here. idea. I'm listening. Yeah. In joining G4, I was ecstatic to be part of something that I grew up watching as a child. But every time G4 is brought up in various channels, even in this YouTube channel, we have the chat in front of us. I can see you. Without a doubt, there will be backlash because I'm not as bangable as the previous host. It's somehow talk to him, Frost. It has somehow been expected that you can talk about how much you jerked off to women as a compliment. That it's weird. not a compliment. It's weird. It's dehumanizing. Now, I will say right off the bat that that is one thing in the rant that I do agree with is that it is weird. I've even had dudes, I'm talking dudes, tell me directly the sort of things they are beating their beat to. Like, I'm really trying to jot down notes and know all that information. So, yes, I do agree with her in that uh, in that regard. But this isn't over. Let's continue. And it's weird. Women do not exist to be nice on the eyes for you. Morgan Webb, Olivia Munn did not exist to be nice on the eyes for you. Hey, she cooking, y'all. And that's just <laughs> obvious sexism. You don't need to explicitly objectify women or declare that you hate women to be sexist. Just go ahead and check out Thorne's latest meltdown on Twitter for some spark notes. Now, here at X-Play, our reviews are written and produced by a team of people. There are too many games for one person to shoulder the burden. So we divide and conquer. And when we use language like we or I, that's the reviewer. That's coming from the mouth and experience of the reviewer reading that review. And that's not to say that Gerard, TBH, Adam, or myself don't contribute to the reviews. We absolutely do. But it'll always be in varying degrees and take a whole team behind us. That's why we're X play and not Adam play. We have done the experiment and controlled for the variables. Adam will read a script written by the same writer that I will read the other half of the script for, but I'll be the one flamed. And yeah, it also happens to Gerard and TBH, but that doesn't discount the sexism of how it happens to me when it does. Both things can be true, that there is a general hatred of any change that isn't Adam, and that all receive special flame just for being a woman. And I wish I could turn the camera around so that you could see the incredible team that make X-Play. Half of our producers and writers are women. Emily, Abby, Megan, Joe, Jake, Zipper, Gabby, it goes on and on and on. Former writers that are now on ATOS like Vanessa. When you're in our DMs or on those YouTube comments or in Twitch chat right now, those reactionary threads thinking that I'm somehow ruining your current X-Play experience because you can't objectify me how you previously did to Morgan or that I'm somehow less qualified to speak on something but you can't quite put your finger on why even though I'm reading the exact same script as Adam but you have no problem with he's part of it. You're letting your unconscious biases ruin my day and you're gatekeeping the gaming space. So maybe for 2022, we'd be a bit nicer, a bit more self-reflective, and we enjoy the fact that people are working hard to make free content for you. If you don't like it, don't watch it. Peace. And that's pretty much the end of that rant. So. Oh man, where do I where do I even begin? Where do I even begin? Even as I watch it now to be honest, I mean, she says a lot of words in under like in under 10 minutes. Like I'm I'm still trying to think like where exactly I I should pick up off of because even after I watch that or even if I, after I listen to it again, I still don't think what she said was all that big of a deal. Um I guess where I'll pick up first is like immediately where I left off the first time I paused it, which was when she touched on, um, when she touched on the premise of previous hosts such as Morgan Webb and Olivia Munn not being or existing to be whether or not they existed to be nice 
on the eyes for the viewers. Now, I think if you're one of these people who really believe that some of these hosts, male or female, are hired and their looks don't play a role, you're absolutely delusional. You are absolutely delusional, especially for broadcast television. You're absolutely delusional if you think that, you know, uh, swagger, uh, you know, swagger, body build, that sort of thing doesn't play in effect at all when it comes to the hiring process for, you know, anything really that's going to be on broadcast television. Now, I will say most likely, um, I will say most likely that uh, it, it's very possible that the standards are probably held a lot higher for um, for females. Um, I think she's still wrong in that regard that, uh, yeah, actually, they probably are very dolled up and they are probably higher to a degree uh, to be nice on the eyes for viewers. Uh, that kind of stuff sells. It just does. It's the reality of the situation. It's we see it. We see it now in Twitch. We see it now with Twitch, and it's not like that's a problem. It's just how things are. It's just it's just the facts. Um, so I think that was probably one of the first main things. It was probably the main thing that I had a problem with what she said because I, I think that's just copium at that point when you say that basically looks don't matter and that oh these people did not look good for you like it's not true that's not true <laughs> that's not true because if they really wanted to they could have had if they really wanted to they could have just had two male hosts for AOTS or X-Play or both they could have just done that they could have just had two dudes Um, they could have just had two dudes but you know the market they're trying to you know the market they're trying to appease you know, you know, you know the type of eyes that are trying to, uh, they're trying to peel. So don't, don't play dumb. Don't play dumb. Don't act like you don't know what it is. And um, I think that that just leads me to the next thing that I wanted to touch on with that is that she's definitely in full copium mode when she goes on this rant because you could tell most of what what this was boiling up from is pretty much just Twitch chat and YouTube comments. Um. <clears throat> I think um I think that for sure like I I can feel I can feel for Frost at the same time because um I think a lot of people who probably have something to say about this aren't are probably not live content creators or maybe they don't live stream all that much um but yeah like definitely she's day in day out is probably getting hurtful comments and i've seen i've seen with my own two eyes the type of comments that i've just heard but all of the all of the new hosts for g4 have been getting the things that people not directly say at them but indirectly mostly uh just because people just aren't careful with how they were things they just don't care they i guess people don't even consider the fact that a lot of these hosts are checking the comments sometimes they're reading what you guys say they can they can see the chat as she said uh in in the rant she could see the chat um but i think the main issue is that um <clears throat> i think that's pretty much what set her off the most is that a lot of this was just really just festering because again i've seen the comments I've seen people who will just straight up say, "Oh, I don't want to. I don't want to watch this guy uh, talk about the game. I don't watch this girl talk about the game. I want Adam." Uh, and that's probably one of the that's probably one of the difficult things about bringing back such beloved hosts and trying to mesh them with uh, new blood, is that a lot of the nostalgia lists, a lot of the OGs, were going to be more inclined to just only want to see the faces that we grew up with. Like, as far as a lot of people are concerned, they really don't care about all these new faces. They really don't care about Frost. They really don't care about TBH. They really don't care about... I mean, because Gerard has been around for a while. He's a little bit beloved. They really don't care about, you know, Fiona Nova. They really don't care about... Um, they really don't care about Cassim. Like, they want... They want... They want Kevin. <laughs> they want Morgan. They want Adam. Like, they want the people that they grew up with. And I've seen a lot of those comments, and I know... Uh, like that rant alone, you can tell like Frost is definitely an emotional person and 
I know that that was festering for a very long time. So a lot of it is just, a lot of it is just, um, a lot of the, it is just internalized, uh, internalized hurt, honestly, just internalized pain. Cause like, especially when the relaunch happened, um, there was a lot of that sentiment that, Oh, I want Adam. I want Kevin. I get these people off the screen, blah, 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 blah. And I think she probably took it as all sexism, uh, when it's definitely not the case, (laughs) probably not the case at all. Um, People just really want to see Adam Sessler. Like, it's been years. People really want to see Kevin Pereira. It's been years. And honestly, these guys, uh, they're so... I mean, okay, well, Adam Sessler is a whole other discussion altogether because I know he. I know for sure, if anybody's more at fault than Frost is uh, here, like, uh, with their takes, I would say it's Adam Sessler. And this comes as... This comes from somebody who... I love Adam Sessler. I freaking love the guy. He like if not for him, <laughs> dude. If not for him, I probably wouldn't be doing videos. I probably would have never gotten into writing about games. He's really he was really uh my icon at the time uh when it comes to, you know, just video game coverage and content. Listening to him speak, listening to him talk about his talk about games and his knowledge was it was it was legendary. It was legendary, and nobody, nobody since has uh, has been able to fill fill that void. Um, so having him back has been huge, even though he's taken more of a a background seat. Like having him back is huge, and I I could not, I can't lie and say, oh yeah, I I would love to see you know nothing more but just the new pe- the new faces. Like no, I want more Kevin, and I want more Adam as as much as the next pe- uh, as much as everybody else. But um, you know, it's it, that's just not. That's just not what this is. It's just not what this is, and it's just not what it was going to be after a little bit. But I think that's probably, again, that's that's one of the really difficult parts with meshing new blood with the old blood is that when you do that, you're essentially splitting your audience right off the bat. And, um, yeah, you're essentially splitting your audience right off the bat. And, uh, uh, that sort of leads me into the next part really quickly. But what I was saying, uh, just touching on this really quick about Adam, is that I definitely feel like he's a lot more at fault when it comes to bad takes, quote unquote, compared to Frost, because you know he alone. You know, if you follow him on social media, you know that he's like super aggressive, super anti tolerant at all whatsoever when it comes to conservatives and people on more on the right of the political spectrum, and you know. I mean, if you if you come out swinging that you know all Republicans or all people on the right are just terrible, demon hell spawn human beings that they all should die. Like, first of all, go go to therapy. Like, get some help. Do something. Like that is that is a state of mind that is just so diseased, so sickened that it's just it, like I, like when you think like that at that point, like you're beyond saving yourself. You're literally isolating. <laughs> that's such a huge chunk of the population like get out talk to people you'll you'll quickly learn that it's not uh, it's not as serious as you think it is um but he's one of those people with one of those takes that are just like oh yeah if you're of this side of the political spectrum uh i'd be better off if you didn't exist and he's very blatant about that and um i think I think while it's not as, I think while it's not really as rooted in emotion, his rants aren't as rooted in in emotion like Frost was. I think his is more genuine, like genuine hate. Whereas Frost, I definitely feel like it was a lot less hate and more pain because um, what she was talking about, I, I knew right away exactly what she was talking about, especially the first time when this w- was live. I knew right away what she was talking about because I seen it firsthand. I see it. I, I saw it right away with uh, the other co-hosts as well as well, how everybody just wanted them out and they just wanted the old blood in. And, you know, if you've got an emotional person on set, on camera, with a chat in front of them and they're seeing that all day while they're live, you know, eventually it's going to boil over and they're going to explode. Now, you would argue, okay, you're doing live television. You're doing entertainment. You got to be able to take the blows. You got to be able to take the hits. Yeah, but uh, you know, some people don't. 
and this is what happens. Um, we've had celebrities blow up before. Um, just you know, they just can't take anymore, and they ended up they end up freaking flipping out live on air. It's happened. It's not new. Um, but that is essentially what I'm saying. What happened with Frost? But this is this this was sort of the whole turning point for the whole thing. This is what really set a lot of people off, and not only that, but. You know, after she finished that rant, you had the studio and a lot of the producers in the background clapping and cheering, like basically supporting everything that she said. And I feel like it was a really awkward position where it's just like, what can you do? What can you do? You just not clap and <laughs> do you just not clap? And then at the same time, you're, you know, you're like, because it's like, if you don't clap, if you don't cheer, you're not acknowledging anything she said. And I definitely think at some point she did have she did have some good points. Like I like at least you could be like, okay, yeah, we hear you. We hear you. Like it's at some points I hear where she's coming from, right? Um, though her rant is a little bit misguided. I hear where she's coming from. I think it's just a lot more rooted in, you know, her own personal insecurities and, you know, her own personal hurt than than truth, but um, that sort of is what set people off, and um, I guess that's sort of where the audience was really split, uh, allegedly. <laughs> and I say allegedly because, again, uh, I feel like a lot of people who just flat out won't watch now and claim it's because of the Frost Grant and claim it's because of, you know, Sessler on Twitter as if he hasn't been this way for years, which he has. Um, so, I mean, he, he is completely irrelevant, but especially for the people who claim that, or that situation or that the way he acts, I guess, on social media, it's completely irrelevant to the numbers of, uh, the numbers of the company and where it's headed right now. Um, and again, like I said, like, I, I feel like the people who were complaining about that probably weren't even really watching in the first place, or maybe just watched the first couple of weeks of the relaunch and just stopped, um, afterwards, but. I guess, so, following that rant, you know, you would think that, oh, yeah, everything's fine and dandy. Um, it was the talk of the town for the longest time. I think the quartering is the person who did the first big video on it, and it really blew up. I don't even know how many views did that get. I think it, did that video hit, like, something like a million views? I wonder if I could find it. I know it had a lot of views, but maybe I'm just remembering it poorly. I mean, every, every video that he does on G4 and the rant, I mean, he's still, he's still covering things from, uh, covering stuff that like, he's still covering the whole rant thing still, even now, but like every single, like I'm seeing 262K views, 242K views, 86K, uh, okay, so 393K is how much it got, um, and then pretty much everything out there everything afterwards was like in the 100k so if you think about that compared to the numbers compared to the numbers that g4 is getting on their videos like they're getting maybe they're getting maybe at best they're getting maybe uh maybe 50 percent of that 50 percent of those numbers and he's pushing these out like every week every single time there's a little bit of drama pertaining to g4 he's pushing those out so if you think about that I could sort of see like that actually taking a hit on their viewership, taking a hit on their numbers. But again, I feel like most of the per most of the people in his audience probably, I mean, this guy has over a million followers. I feel like most people in his audience probably weren't even really watching to begin with. Um, but it is bad press and bad press is bad press. And eventually um, if it's enough and if it's strong enough and if it's constant enough, it will catch up with you. And I think, that could be possibly what we're seeing now and what has led to some of the things that have been happening, which I promise I'm going to get into. But first, uh, I mean, let me talk a little bit about what they what they were able to do since that time, what kind of stuff they were working on. So the reboot happened back in like February, January. And um, I mean, since then, all has been seeming like it's been dandy. They had a bright future ahead of them. Um, you know, I went to uh, their first show, I think, their first uh they uh G4 themselves uh and the team they went to PAX East I think that was their first community show that they they went to um and uh you know they had a panel and everything and they announced some new shows there they announced uh the God of War the God of Work uh which featured Gerard uh the completionist he was playing Kratos so that was like a a, a 
a short little mini series that they did that they just recently released, but they announced that during um they announced that during um during PAX East. I think they announced a couple more things as well. It was just really a show that they got to meet up with fans and uh and talk about some stuff that they're working on behind the scenes. <clears throat> and then um I think a little bit after that they started um Name Your Price, which was uh, a uh like a game show uh hosted by Will Neff and Austin Shows. Actually I think Name Your Price may have debuted a little bit before PAX East, which was in April. I think Name Your Price may have debuted like late February, maybe early March, somewhere around there, because I do remember Austin Shows was on the loop with Kevin Pereira and at that time like he was there just basically advertising the show and that was uh, that was like end of February. So yeah, I think name your price name your price happened before the PAX East. And then uh, you know, Hey Donna is another show um hosted by Will Neff. This one's hosted by Neff Will Neff. Name your price is um that's more of Austin Show's dedicated show. Um but Hey Donna recently debuted and that has proven to be a pretty I would say that's probably one of the biggest hits that they've been able to come up with um as a production or uh, as a company i think hey donna is like their biggest production outside of attack of the show i think that's probably one of the best ones that they've come up with and i think well the latest one or uh, hey donna is the latest one but arena which you may may or may not know of from uh old school g4 also made its return uh being hosted by uh wwe austin creed um or how do they say it? WWE King Woods, aka Austin Creed, and uh, Gina Darling. Uh, so him and Gina, Austin and Gina, host that show, and it's basically, it's basically like a celebrity game show for the most part. Uh, they play games and they do, uh, do they do obstacle courses? I don't even remember. Uh, it, they do a lot of different stuff. It's basically a celebrity game show, but mostly it's featuring wrestlers and like esports players sort of facing off against each other. It's like a different rivalry. Every couple weeks or so, I think it's uh, is it, I think it's like a bi-weekly show or is it, is it monthly? I can't really remember, um, but I would say that one proved to be a pretty big hit as well. But that's one of their very large scale production shows. I feel like, I feel like that one might end up getting cut, but I'm not sure. It just came back. It would really suck if it got cut. But I mean, overall content wise, ever since that rant, even though. Uh, even though accordingly or uh, allegedly people have been dwindling down, uh, you know, just leaving, leaving the platform, leaving their show and just stop viewing. Um, <laughs> they, they've they still been pushing out the content. So I'm really not sure there's a disconnect somewhere. And I think it's just because from the get go, not as many people have been watching that they originally anticipated. And that sort of leads into the main, I guess, trials and tribulations of the whole thing and where this has all led up to is uh, the recent layoffs that were announced. Um, was it last week? I think it was last week that this happened, the 14th. Um, so, yeah, this was la. Oh, no, this wasn't last week. It was a couple weeks ago. Um, but I will go into this anyway. Um, the main... The main uh, news drop came out from uh, came out from Kotaku, and the same day that the layoffs happened, you know, the company tweeted due to uh, due to unforeseen circumstances. Been talking for too long. Due to unforeseen circumstances, all G Four streams today have been canceled, but we will return with all of our regularly scheduled content tomorrow. So they canceled AOTS for that week, uh, along with some other shows. Um, because layoffs just randomly hit as they were about to film and as they were about to go live. And uh, I'll read up on this article real quick. <clears throat> and uh, there's a lot of updates, but I remember most of it from the top of my head. But um, long story short, at least somewhere between 20 to 30 staff members were laid off at G4 TV. According to, uh, according to the three sources familiar with the business, the video game talk show network from the 2000s was rec resurrected last fall on streaming platforms like Twitch as well as cable TV, but now faces major upheaval less than a year later. I truly cannot imagine the company continuing to produce our slate of content without people we lost today, said one employee. The timing and severity of the cuts 
took staff by surprise with talent showing up on set today ready to film only to have programming canceled as HR reps met individually with employees. While it's not clear what the extent of the layoffs will be, one source said those affected were told they would receive anywhere between 16 weeks and 6 months of uh, severance based on their tenor with Comcast, g parent company. And um, so this is where things get a little bit more darker. Three sources tell Kotaku that g finances have been in bad shape for some time and managers were tasked with looking for cost savings wherever possible. Things apparently came to a head during an all-hands meeting a couple months ago when then G4 President Russell Aarons discussed the troubles the business was facing and proposed unrealistic revenue goals for the year ahead. Um, where was I? The year ahead staff felt blindsided, one source said, due to a lack of clear goals for measuring success against up to that point. Aaron's left shortly after and was replaced by Comcast Spectator Executive Joe Marsh, whose sources say was only interested in finding ways to slash the budget. The suddenness and severity of today's layoffs were unexpected, however, and call into question what future of the new G4 will be. The network just recently announced a slate of new content, including a satirical X-Play show called God of Work, a play on Sony's hit uh, God of War series. Um... So that's pretty much like the meat and potatoes of it. Um, there's a quick update in the article, and this is something that I was watching live as well. G4 hosts Fiona Nova and Case Blackwell went live at 2 p.m. on September 15th on Twitch Thursday for the latest episode of The Feedback and addressed the layoffs, reassuring viewers that while close, close colleagues had been laid off, there were no plans to scale back the channel's programming. Um <clears throat> And uh, I know one of them said, at the end of the day, nothing has changed. We are literally going to be doing the same amount of content we've been doing since last November. Uh, That was by Fiona Nova. We're growing, and this is what growth looks like. It has its ups and downs. And um, probably the biggest of the updates, and this was the latest one to this article on September 20th, a week after the layoffs, Kotaku has learned that X-Play host Indiana Froskir and Black is no longer with G4. Comcast G4's parent company brought out the remainder of her contract, bought out the remainder of her contract, according to two sources familiar with the business. The news was announced internally by Joe Marsh in a town hall meeting on Tuesday morning. So, yeah, Frost was let go. Obviously, it was more than likely due to all the bad press that just having her on the team was receiving. Um, I know after she was let go, rumors started uh, spiraling once again that Adam Sessler was next on the chopping block, which would really suck because even though he has (laughs) his social media track record is terrible, um, there is a very good chunk of G4 that still supports, still watches because he is a part of the platform. Same th- and losing Kevin and losing Adam during about the same period of time. Oh, I have to get into that, don't I? About the same period of time is, I mean, it's a huge blow. It's a huge blow. But I feel like if they really want to sort of s- clean the slate and start fresh, as painful as it would be, I feel like this is probably the best way to go about it is to really try and build that audience from scratch you know, tell the nostalgia heads that, hey, either you guys want to uh, support us and see what we do in the future with this fresh, this team of fresh faces or, you know, so long, farewell, thanks for the good times. And, uh, yeah, I think that's a decision they have to make. Um, uh, but, yeah, so, I mean, rumors uh, rumors regarding Adam Sessler's uh, departure, you know, started very shortly after um, after Frost left, and actually, I'm gonna do a quick uh, dig real quick, because I know I know at the time those rumors started. I believe that same day there was a video that went up on the X Play channel or on the G4 channel that was featuring Adam Sessler. Like he did a review that same day, um, and um, uh, 
I'm on the wrong channel. <laughs> I'm on the wrong channel. The, that's another thing is they have way too many different YouTube channels. They have a G4 main channel, and then they have an X-Play channel and an Attack of the Show channel. And it's like, dude, you guys have too many channels. You guys have too many channels. So, yeah, I mean, there's a channel. Uh, there's a video 11 days ago that was Adam Sussler's video. And it's important to note that his videos get the most amount of views out of everything else on the channel. This Assassin's Creed video that he did has 52k video, uh, 52k views, um, compared to the four most recent videos, 30k, 5.8k, 6.2k, 8.6k, um, and even stuff from a month ago. His recent Assassin's Creed video video has the most amount of views. Everything he has is closing in qu all the videos that he has done are pretty much closing in quick on 50k almost almost but yeah um he did announce a couple months ago that he would be taking more of a backseat role dur uh for x play he's not going to be on the live shows uh anymore really he's just more so going to be on the uh just doing youtube content so he's kind of been gone in general for a very good chunk of time he was around for the relaunch a couple weeks a couple shows and a couple weeks into the relaunch and then whew, he was gone for pretty much all offline stuff and um yeah he was gone for pretty much all offline stuff but he did do uh youtube videos every now and then and then sort of made his formal return earlier this year but stated yeah i'm gonna be more in the background not on live shows as much i'm getting old I'll see you guys on YouTube was sort of the situation. And yeah, he's been kind of staying true to that. Um, but yeah, I mean, having him let go, I, I feel like if people are really that frustrated with him, I think not having him on the live show is probably a good direction. Just having him do YouTube content. Cause he definitely brings in the views to the YouTube having like losing, losing out on somebody who could bring in 50 K views to your videos or is a huge blow. But like I said, I think uh, I think anybody who's into G4, <coughs> or I guess this recent reboot, should really prepare themselves for a future, if the company even has a future at this point. You should really prepare yourself for a future where Kevin and, and Adam are just not a part of it. And that sort of leads me into the next thing, um, is that Ad, uh, Kevin Pereira, host of the Attack of the Show, while we knew for some time that he was likely going to be riding off into the sunset, he wasn't going to be around forever, especially considering his recent skincare uh, cancer or his skin cancer uh, announcement um, earlier in the year. We found out he has skin cancer. Um, we knew he was going to be taking a lot of time for himself. He's taken a lot of shows off, so it was only a matter of time. Um but yeah, there was a report that came out saying that he was uh, going to be leaving sometime in October, when in reality he actually left uh, last week, or uh, two weeks ago was his final show. No, it was last week was his final show, I believe. Um, and yeah, I mean, like, well, he'll probably cameo sometimes, like, he's very close with some of the other hosts of AOTS, uh, you know, the Cream Team, if you guys actually follow... <laughs> follow him and you know his uh his endeavors uh he'll be around but he is as as of now he's no longer officially a part of g4 he has done his part he has built the team and um yeah he's a uh, he's he's a goner now so it wasn't really it didn't really have anything to do with the layoffs this was if you watched any of their broadcasts you know that this was a long time coming None of them were going to be around forever. All of them were on contracts, like one-year contracts to begin with. Um, and, uh, yeah, this is sort of how the cookie crumbles. So, I mean, I guess at this point, the question is, where do they go from here? And um, it's like I was saying, <laughs> either we prepare for a future where, you know, uh, it's just all new faces, and we sort of dial it back on the production of this stuff. Um, because, you know, they definitely have went all out with a lot of these shows. And if this, and just based on the views that they got alone, it just doesn't really seem sustainable. I definitely, if 
everything just doesn't get shut down, which is what seems like a lot of people want at this point. Um, I know a lot of diehards are we're willing to we're willing to see what they can come up with with all the new faces with all the new hosts, but you know if I don't know how they're going to be able to do that and have it be financially sustainable without completely dialing back on the on the content, and it's something that I've noticed that they've been doing even now, even though uh, I believe it was Fiona Nova who made that statement that they would be delivering the same amount of content each and every week. I mean, I guess it's been good for the most part, but um, uh, even now I can see that they're starting to dial back a bit or things are at least shuffling around because you have X-Play streams are, I mean, we've lost uh, pretty much all the X-Play people, right? There's only Gerard is the only official host that's left, Gerard and Emily. Um, those two are the only ones because Frost is gone. TBH, uh, his contract ran out earlier, I think in the summer, his contract, no. I think his contract ran out in August, actually, so he's no longer there. So the X-Play has just become basically a live stream, hang out with us and chat and watch us play video games is basically what it's become. And at that point, it's just like, okay, why not just watch any other streamer? Now, what they had before, the whole talk show format, that's something that not a lot of people are doing anymore these days. It's, it's refreshing because we don't really have that. IGN stopped most of their video game talk shows. GameSpot stopped most of theirs. Game Informer stopped most. Like, none of these people have, like, full-scale production, like, talk video game talk shows anymore. And that's what X-Play sort of offered. It was unique in that regard. But now it's... Now what they're doing is just... I mean, it's the same stuff you could find on <laughs> any other any other Twitch channel. Now, now it's became what people were saying it was before when it wasn't. Now it's became what people were claiming it was before, which was just something you could find on any other Twitch channel. So thanks a lot. <laughs> you guys have manifested exactly what you were saying it was. Now it's true, but before it wasn't. Um, but I mean, outside of that, AOTS is on break for two weeks. Um, I'm not really sure what that's going to look like with Kevin gone for good. It'll be really interesting to see. I'm assuming... Um, I'm assuming uh, Kasim and um, Xavier Woods are going to be the two main rotating hosts for that show now. I think they're the ones on the team that are most capable of doing that. Um, and I think they're both pretty funny guys. I think Kasim more so. But I feel like uh, I feel like King Woods is probably a better host, whereas Kasim is just a much better entertainer. He's more funny, um, more quippy. Um, so I guess we'll just have to see. I guess we'll have to see how it works out. Like I said, they're essentially starting from scratch completely now. Um, this is like reboot part two for them. Um, and uh, yeah, I feel like if they can't bring up the numbers after this break, I really don't see them continuing into 2023. I mean, I don't want to be super skeptical. And even though they're saying, oh, don't worry, guys, everything's going to be fine. Um you know, they've said time and time again that, oh, yeah, everything's fine. Trust us. Like, the money is fine. We're all fine. I know enough now to the point where they're just saying it to look good. And um, I think at this point, like, it's pretty safe to say that things aren't fine. Now, I will say that uh, I believe it was reported that they have some 200, almost 300 employees and only 20 were cut. I think only 14 to 20 were cut, were confirmed cut at the time that that article came out. That's not a huge blow. I mean, 20 to 14 people cutting that many out of like 200, 300 is not that big of a deal. I mean, it sucks those people lost their jobs. I'm sure one way or another, it's it might hurt the shows a little bit, the production of the shows a little bit. Like they're going to have voids that are, they're going to have to fill. Maybe some areas they're going to have to cut back on. But it's not like half of the operation being cut. It's not even a quarter of the operation being cut. So, uh, I mean, if they, I felt, I feel like if they were really in trouble, if they were really in trouble and they felt like it was really necessary to dial back with costs, they would have cut a lot more people. I think they would have cut a lot more people. But with such a small amount, I think it's probably safe to say that maybe we're blowing it out of proportion just a little bit. But like I said, again, I've seen the numbers and the numbers are not that great. So um, we'll just have to see how this plays out. 
we'll have to see how this plays out. I think anybody making videos on this, acting like they know what they're talking about, unless they they're working for the company, um, it's all just speculation. So try not to let those those videos like influence your views all that much, especially if you enjoy the content. Try not to become that much of a doomer over everything, but it does hurt, um, especially when when Kevin announced last week that it was going to be his last show. Like, let me tell you, like that one, that one stung. That one stung. And this is coming as somebody who I really didn't pay much attention to KP uh, during G4's first run. I was more of the Adam Sessler stan. Um, but ever since you know the relaunch was uh ever since the relaunch was announced and I went back to watch more AOTS um K KP just grew on me like crazy like I I can't put into words like how awesome of a guy that is how entertaining how much of a god S tier host that guy is just freaking incredible like and like it just feels like uh, I don't know it just feels like I lost him too soon you know it's like rediscovering a gem and uh, yeah, it sucks. It sucks. I was really hurt over his loss, but you know, it is what it is. I knew it wasn't gonna be forever, so I was more prepared for it. But um, yeah, it really does kind of suck. Um, but yeah, that's uh, that's honestly pretty much everything I wanted to touch on. That is really my whole G four rant. Honestly, uh, I, I probably won't rant about it anymore unless something else happens. I don't really see myself doing a whole nother dedicated uh dedicated podcast talking point episode or uh, sorry, another podcast episode with a talking point dedicated to this stuff unless they announce their closure or something, which even then I don't really want to have to re go through everything I just talked about today, which led up to the closure. I don't want to have to do that. Um it'll probably just be in a in a news talking point for the week, but um yeah, that's pretty much everything I wanted to talk about regarding uh, regarding the trials and tribulations of the G4 TV reboot. Honestly, you know, I, I really do hope that they can make it into next year. Um, I know even COVID definitely uh, dampened their relaunch a little bit. Like, COVID was definitely a huge factor. Um, but I think, uh, I think now, like, you don't really have that excuse. Um, you have the quote-unquote troublesome people out of the way on the team and uh I guess the most expensive people as well with KP and Sessler gone even though they're on contracts it's not like they're being paid like salary um or being paid hourly but you know now that you have a uh, uh, a little less expensive of an operation it's just like all right what can we do with this where where can we go from here and uh you know I really hope they just listen to the fans I hope they uh they really brainstorm with us because yeah, I mean like I think the fans know best. I think the fans know best and you know, if anything, there are a lot of creative people within the G four community, like viewer based community. I think they could really uh give them some guidance on where what kind of content to make, what kind of stuff we would like to see. So that's just sort of what I would like to see going forward, but it's all speculation at this point this whole operation could shut down tomorrow and everything that I've said today could be completely irrelevant, but you know, we won't know the true, all the secrets and whatnot until it actually does shut down. And then that's when all the stuff will, will come spilling out. Um, but like KP said, he, he claimed that, you know, the first incarnation of G4 went through a lot of reshufflings, a lot of ups and downs before it even got to the point, um, before we even got to the G4 that we fondly remember, I think were his exact words. So I don't know if Comcast is willing to give it as much time because from the sounds of it, it seems like they really just wanted immediate profit, wanted to see immediate growth. And we're technically not even in November yet, so it hasn't even been a full year. Um, part of me just hopes that, you know, they put this on a year plan or like a multi-year plan at least to sort of just give it a little bit more time, like, give it a time to sort of clean the slate, which is happening now, and then see what, see what it can become a year from now. Just give it a little bit more time. I mean, you guys are Comcast. You guys got the money. Like, come on, come on. Don't, don't kill, don't kill our hopes and dreams like this. <laughs> you know, we millennials don't have much left. We got G4 and nothing else. <laughs> Let me stop. But, uh, anyway, 
yeah, that's pretty much all I wanted to touch on today with today's talking point, which is trials and tribulations of G4 TV. Hopefully you guys enjoyed that rant. I am going to get ready to close up this shop now for this episode. What a long one it has been. What a long one has it been? Have we hit two hours? We've hit two hours. We've hit two hours of just constant talking. And let me tell, let me say, let me tell you this right now. Um, I think, uh, <laughs> I think, um, going forward, most episodes are probably going to be around one to two hours. I don't really want to go over the two hour mark, but I think especially when I have co-hosts on, it's going to be a lot. It's probably. I think two and a half hours is probably going to be a standard, probably, but it depends. When it's myself, I tend to rant on for a little bit and, uh, you know, just keep going and going and going. But, um, yeah, this has been a pretty lengthy one. We've talked about a lot today. Um, some quick announcements before I run out. Some quick stuff that I would like to personally update. Um, first and foremost, I have my new tournament series for... 2022 Year of the Serpent is starting next week. Devour the competition. We've got Year of the Serpent tournament events all happening online. Some some of the featured games are Dungeon Fighter Duel, King of Fighters 15, Smash Bros. Ultimate, Grand Blue Fantasy Versus, and Guilty Gear Strive, and more coming soon. Um, uh, events for that kicks off next week, actually. Next week's going to be a busy week. If there's any week that might be no G-Sync, it'll be next week um, because there is a tournament that I have to run on Thursday and Friday, assuming we get enough uh, registrants uh, or attendees. I think next week is supposed to be... Yeah, so next week is a kickoff week, and that's supposed to be Smash Ultimate and Grand Blue. Um, And then the following week, I believe I announced DNF Duel is going to be happening. Um, so yeah, if there's any week that there won't be G Sync in October, or at least it'll be late, it's gonna be uh, it's gonna be next week. So just a heads up for that. For episode two, um, there's probably be a little delay in between now and the second episode. So stay tuned for that. But yes, I've got a tournament series that kicks off next week. So keep an eye out uh, for that. I'll be posting the Matcherino pages and whatnot probably. Later this weekend and into next week, we'll be doing a little bit of just pr- promoting it a little bit, trying to get the word out a little bit more. Um, What else do I need to touch on? What else do I need to touch on? Is there anything else I need to touch on? I don't know. I guess I, might, I'm, I, guess I may as well mention the whole streaming situation. I haven't streamed in... At, at this point in time, I haven't streamed in three weeks. <laughs> it's been about three weeks. Well, actually, that's not true. I did do a stealth stream the other night, but I didn't. Uh, it was just a stealth stream. It was no cam. I didn't tweet it out. I didn't post it in the Discord. I didn't do any of that. I just went live for a couple hours, played some Hearthstone. Um, but yeah, I haven't been on stream for three weeks. Why? Um, I've just been preparing for a lot of stuff. I've just been so sidetracked. Every single day is like, okay, I'm going to do this. Can't get to it. Uh, on top of that, I, I'm working slightly longer hours now, and yeah, it's just, it's just it, trying to get on a whole, trying to get on a schedule that works is just, I don't even think it's possible for me anymore, honestly. And I don't want, I don't want that to be a red flag for G Sync episodes because, I mean, uh, that's part of the reason, like making time for to do this too, and uh, to make sure these go out properly and on time. But I've really just been catching up with a ton of other stuff. Um, it really was not meant to be this freaking long. Three weeks? I've missed out on three weeks of progress for Dragon Quest and tons of other things. So um, going into October here, it's going to be a crazy like crunch time sort of month. Um, I think uh, starting this or starting next week, since at the time I'm recording this, it's uh, Friday night. Um, going into next week. The when I do go live, the hours are gonna be just absurd. It's gonna be crazy. I think October, I'm really going to have to like freaking push myself super hard because on top of doing this, uh, str- catching up on streaming and tons of other things, it's it, oh and the tournaments too. It's gonna be like super freaking exhausting. But um, yeah, it's gonna be very uh, it's gonna be a very hard month. But uh, I will be back to streaming next week. 
um, on Monday. I may even try and go live earlier again this weekend, but I don't think that'll happen tomorrow. It'll probably be Monday or Sunday night is when I will go live. And I think, um, I think Facebook streams are probably going to be pretty much done. I don't think I'm going to be streaming on Facebook anymore. Um, I don't know. I might. I think for October, for sure, I won't be on Facebook. It, it really depends on how much I can catch up on all the other stuff I'm supposed to be streaming on Twitch. But uh, for the most part, right as of now, I will not be live on Facebook. What I'll be doing is doing daytime streams when I can on Twitch so we could just get in even more crunch time with whatever I'm trying to grind out. So um, pretty much all my catch up time is going to be on Twitch for this month. And if I feel like I'm at a point where things are just decently ca caught up, I will I will go back to doing Facebook during the days um, with like Fortnite and Warzone and stuff like that. I mean, Warzone 2 is coming and uh, yeah, I know I'll be on I'll be streaming that for sure on Facebook. So. That's pretty much it. That is pretty much everything that I wanted to touch on. So, yeah. I don't know what else to say. How do I even close this out? I don't even know how to close this out. This is crazy. Uh, it's just, it feels really weird to, to, uh, <laughs> to uh, end a podcast because I've, I've never, I don't think I've ever done it in this way before. I don't think so. Um, but yeah. That has been uh, the first episode of Season Zero for G-Sync. If you guys enjoyed the show, uh, make sure you subscribe. I think I'm, this is going up on the YouTube first, but if you enjoyed the show, make sure you subscribe to the YouTubes. Hit that bell. Hit that sub button. Um, this will also be up on my official website somewhere on glakegg.net. And once I get the RSS going, it's going to be up on... I mean, I, I don't have any... I don't have any official, well, okay, let me not lie. I think it should be up on Google Play at some point. Um, Spotify? And I think there was one other. But I can't really remember the platform. Basically, once you get an RSS set up, and it's, it's a lot easier if you own, if you run your own website, it's so easy to just distribute podcasts to other platforms, apparently. So that's what we're going to be doing. But that stuff, I'll, I'll I'll have to tweet it out when it comes. But for now, or if you want to find these, they'll be on my YouTube right away, and they'll be on my website shortly after. So, yeah, I'll drop the links for both, or for the website in the video, or uh, in the video description for sure. So, hopefully, you guys enjoyed this first episode. I'll see you guys in a week or two with episode two, and we'll talk about a whole lot more. So, I'll see you guys then. Thank you for your energy. Take care.